My name is Josephine McCarthy. Um, I'm a magician, a writer and a teacher. And I've been working in magic since the 1970s. And one of the things I've tried to bring to magical training to move things forward a little bit within in the streams of magic that I work in is a closer uh, relationship with the environment. Um, magic can often become um, very separated from nature, from everything that's around you. Um, and that doesn't help to build a relationship with the powers that are around you. Magic is a part of nature, just as we're a part of nature. And by building a, a healthier relationship with our environment and everything that lives around us, we become emotionally invested in it. If we become emotionally invested in it properly, then we look after it better. Um, we identify with it more. So what I'd like to talk about um, for the magical Magic and Ecology Conference is beings, spirits, which is a part of magic. Um, and when we work with these spirits, um, we work in various different ways with them. One of the ways of working in magic with beings um, is through the imagination. And what we do is basically build structure through our imagination that acts as an interface and acts as an exteriorization. And with beings, the imagination dresses those beings and makes them into something that we can understand, that, that we can communicate with and that we can relate to. So often, you know, you, you find the presentations of these beings are very humanesque or, or very animal looking. Um, and that's our imagination. Um, that's that's doing the translating for us so that we can find common ground um, so that you can talk to the consciousness of a forest or of a mountain or a river or, or the weather um, and by doing this you build up um, a form of communication that becomes ongoing and basically in magic that's called pattern building pattern building can happen um, in ritual when you create boundaries um, by this is a room these are the altars and directions these are the tools I'm working with that creates a boundary and it creates a pattern it creates a pattern of behavior of thought of energy that you can then operate within you can also do that in nature it's looser um, for the want of a better word it's more shamanic um, but it still has the, the, the same structure to it. So you're building patterns through your imagination. Um, you go to a forest, you're talking to the forest, you talk to a forest spirit, which your imagination dresses in a particular way, which has come straight out of your imagination. And is it your subconscious that you're talking to? Quite likely. Um, in, especially in the early stages of magic and magical training, that isn't an issue. You, many people these days get themselves tied in knots of, well, you know, I had this being talking to me, but I think it's myself. And how do I actually talk to beings? Well, how you actually talk to beings in nature is by talking to everything. And when things talk back to you, it doesn't matter if it's your own subconscious that's talking to you because it creates patterns, it creates pathways. And by creating patterns and pathways, you're then able to stretch through the imagination and beyond it to actually communicate with the land around you. And it's not that the land has a spirit that looks like a human. It's that the pattern of the consciousness of the land when it flows through your imagination, your imagination translates that into something that you can recognize so that you can, it's like a translator, it's like a, a go-between. And the go-between can be your subconscious. It, you, you could construct it purely out of your imagination. It doesn't matter. What matters is that the communication actually happens um, so that you're not second guessing yourself all the time. Um, which allows things to start to 
stretch out and bump up against you and communicate with you. And I see it as patterns of consciousness, that everything has a pattern of consciousness. And it's a whole other discussion as to what consciousness actually is. How do we define it? That's irrelevant at this stage in, in magical working. Um, if your subconscious is projecting something, that's all well and good. You build up these patterns, you build up patterns of behavior, you build up patterns of communication, you build up patterns of consciousness. Everything has a pattern and all these patterns are constantly changing and interacting. This is from a magical perspective. They're, they're constantly changing. You're constantly interacting with them, whether you're aware of it or not. But when you do become aware and you do become engaged and focused, over a long period of time, you start to really pick up on these energetic patterns and the, these patterns of consciousness. And through communicating on a, a regular basis, you start to feel when there's a shift, when there's a change, when there's a danger. And that, again, builds a closer emotional relationship with the land. And as magic is becoming more and more popular, um, especially with younger generations, this, this can be very interesting. Um, as magic evolves, the, magic has been stuck very much in a 19th century pattern for the longest time. Um, since the 1960s and 70s with chaos magic and, and anthropologists looking at other cultures, it has loosened up a bit, but it is still very much a me um, and the world. And how do I navigate through the world? And what can it give me? How can it protect me? And a lot of that thinking comes from um, Christianized culture, um, where, you know, everything is, God gave us everything to feed us. So those sorts of concepts in religions over a long period of time affect the consciousness of the culture and it affects how the culture responds to things. Um, and even today, if you're, you're not a Christian or you're not a Muslim, if you consider yourself, I'm not a this, I'm not a that, I'm maybe a this, I'm maybe a that, it's irrelevant. The actual structure of the behavioral patterns are embedded within the culture because Christianity has been such a prominent um, force in the West for 15, 1600 years. So keeping that awareness as you take magic into nature is very important. There's an old maxim in magic is know yourself, and which is really, really important in magic to be constantly re reflecting upon yourself, what you do, why you do it and how you do it. And as the younger generations come up through magic and, and push for change and evolution, that can become part of, and it is becoming part of the magical pattern, that it moves a step further. The 1950s and 60s, um, and also back in the 20s, um, brought an awareness of the environment into magical thinking. Now it needs to step further another step by the equal communication, the, the equal relationships and emotional investment. So, you know, what is it that you're speaking to when, when you're talking to these beings and, and you're working in vision? Vision um, uses the imagination, not in a psychological construct like path working, but it basically has a, you are going to A and you're going to try and connect with B and then you're going to come out again. And that's about as much dressing as, as you get for a lot of it. What you're doing is stepping into the imagination um, as though it was a place um, and then working from there in your communication. The more that happens within the youth, within the um, younger magicians, the more it becomes normalized, um, the more it becomes a natural way of being. People tend to separate out magic from their everyday life. It isn't, it is a part of your life. If you're a magician, everything you do is magical. How you interact on a daily basis with everything that's natural outside of you 
is part of magic and it's part of your everyday life. And if that can grow through the future generations of magic and beyond into more popular culture, that would be a wonderful thing because it would cause huge shifts in, in how we approach everything. And the younger generations that I've been seeing coming up are more clued in and, and more aware of the issues with the environment and with nature. So if you can then push that bit, that bit further into the use of the imagination um, to communicate, that would be very good. So again, what are we speaking to? Really, we don't know. You know, if, if you want to take this from um, an objective point of view, we just don't know. Um, in religion, you know, we have deities, we have angels, we have demons, we have all these different names and boxes that, that we give to things that talk to us. Um, in magic, it, it can go to the point of being ridiculous where everything has a color, a time, a day, an element to this to that, because that's easy information that you can grasp onto. Um, and then you feel you can use that in order to make a connection. But really, we these names mean nothing. Um, the way I've been working with beings and, and quite a few other magicians is that, you know, you, you don't box and organise. What you do is you classify in your mind by what they do, um, how they are, how they react to you. Um, where do they, you know, how did you make that connection? Where were you when you make that connection? So it's functional. You give them functional identities. Um, when you're working out in nature, in magic, with these beings, if you're working in a forest, for example, and you're very quiet in the forest, and, and if you're used to visionary work over a long period of time, you can actually walk around while working in vision. Um, and you can come up against some of these vessels, these, these beings, this, this consciousness, the patterns from the land, which dress themselves in particular ways. Um, you could be talking to the hive consciousness of the forest. You could be talking to the smallest little rock about half a mile away that you never even noticed. You could be talking to the plants, the fungus, anything. It, it doesn't matter it presents itself within the forest as a forest being and says, hi. So you have to say hi back. If, you, if someone starts talking to you in a cafe, you don't want to see their CV. You don't need to know their genetic lines. You don't need to know who their grandparents are. You don't need to know where they live. You start talking to them and you respond accordingly by how they act towards you and what they're saying. And this is basically the same rule of thumb for working with spirits in nature. Um, when, you're, when you go out in nature and you, you walk around and you're working in vision in your mind at the same time, that's the first layer. This enables you to make a connection with something that, that is closer to, to you as a human. <clears throat> this, this sort of construct of a, a being that looks part human. You can talk to that. But that's a surface presentation. That's a surface connection. You can then start to stretch beyond that, if, especially if you're going to the same places. Like I live on Dartmoor and um, I regularly go out into the landscape around me and, and the garden and everything else and talk to everything. And I've been doing that for years. So things talk back. I don't work in vision with the presentations for that. I did to start with as an introduction, um, both for myself, for my own consciousness, my own subconsciousness, and also for the beings that are around me. Um, so now I go out in the, in the woods here, and if something's wrong or something's coming, I feel a change in the pattern. What do I mean by that? Everything is constantly changing, everything, all the time. Every day is a different day. Weather patterns, moisture, the river, the behavior of the river, everything is constantly moving and changing within a pattern that is constantly expressing itself and also evolving and changing and dying back at the same time. That's how I see it in magic is that everything 
is creations of patterns, um, the evolutions of patterns, and then the destruction of patterns and the birth of new patterns. So you just constant concepts of these, these inner patterns, which have no physical form, it's consciousness, it's energy, it's whatever. Um, but they have a pattern of behavior, they have set, set ways of feeling. So when, when I walk out in the woods, I know the feeling of the woods and what I'm feeling is the pattern of the consciousness of that collective in nature. If something's coming, if there's a bad storm coming, sometimes, not every time, but sometimes you can feel a change in the pattern a good week or two before something happens. Explaining what that is, I don't know. You know, is it, is it time jumping? Is it the formation of an inner pattern that I'm then beginning to feel? I don't know, but I feel the shift, I feel the change. So immediately what I'll do is say, is there anything I can do? And I say that with my mind, I say that with my voice. Is there anything you need? Is there anything I can do? And what you do is you listen and feel for the response. <clears throat> so sometimes you will, you know, you, you, you ask, is there anything I can do? And nothing changes, which I take as a no, go away, we're fine. Just, we're just letting you know. And sometimes I'll get a feeling of <clears throat> something's not right. Can you do something? Something's not right. And when you don't get very clear, oh, yes, I'd like you to do X, Y, and Z and do it here and honor this and give a gift to that. To me, that's your subconscious talking a lot of the time. <clears throat> when you get vaguer things that you wouldn't have thought of or, or you weren't expecting, to me, that's more of a, a, a natural communication. And you know, it can be very simple stuff like, yes, there's something coming. Can you just move that for me, please? Okay, pick up a big rock, move it. Um, could you go around the corner and pick those things up? What things? Go around the corner. There's a lot of plastic. Oh, there's a lot of bags. And if a storm comes in, they'll get pushed into the river and they'll do damage. So you go and you pick things up. It's very simple. It's not very glamorous. Um, it's an everyday thing. Um, and that to me is, is one of the crucial parts of working with the landscape, working with the weather, working with the elements, is it's mundane little things every day, the everyday connections, the everyday little actions. That forms the bonds. And then from magic, you can take that further. You take the relationship further over time as trust builds. You can then, you, you're sick, you go into the forest, you lie down. You're still going to be sick when you come out, but something shifts. Your, inter your pattern interacting with the pattern of the forest does something. It changes something. And you take that away with you. And then when the forest gets sick, you go in and take your pattern and you lie down and you stretch your consciousness out. You stretch your pattern out and feel if there's anything you can do, can you just energetically feed what's around you? Um, can you cause a shift magically? So you're building these very vague patterns of behavior that where it, it's not a clear road. It's not something you can just read in a book and go outside and do like a recipe. It's about subtleties of relationships that build up day after day month after month by going out and connecting with something in nature and that's long lasting that changes who you are it changes how you perceive the land around you if you live in a city um you know i lived in a city a few times for a year or two at a time i i don't do cities very well at all but one of the things i did notice in living in the city is nature is still there it's just under the concrete for the most part but every so often you'd be walking down the road and you'd see a weed pushing up through a crack in the pavement. And I'd say, oh, good on you. Good for you. You know, you, you keep at it. That's a way of connecting with nature in a city. It's all around you. You just don't see it. 
and you you learn to communicate to connect to you know you feed birds you talk to them you hang out with them within two or three generations of those birds they get to know you um, and with some birds it's a lot quicker than that um, there's a lot of rooks around here and uh, and crows and their wingmen which are jackdaws and they figured out that I would feed them and they figured out that you know when they're nesting they they need a lot of high fat content so I'd put high fat content out for them so now they come and ask so I know when they're sitting on eggs and, and they're getting ready to hatch because they start coming banging on the window and demanding food they also turn up if they're injured and that's another thing is again knowing yourself and knowing how to have an equal relationship with nature. It's very tempting when you come across an injured animal or bird and they, or they turn up at your door, which happens a lot to magicians, they feel your pattern, they come, they lay on your doorstep, is that you do what you can for that animal and then you let them go. With some people, they get this, oh, but I can have a pet bird. You know, I can have a pet badger or a pet hedgehog. I'll heal it and it'll stay and be my friend. That's about you. That's not about the animal. That's not about nature. And it's understanding that and learning to let go and not make it all about you. Those, If those messages could get through into wider popular culture, of it really isn't about you. And yes, do talk to everything. And if people think you're mad, well, tough. You're building a relationship with the world that you live in, just as you build a relationship with your friends, your family and, and your, your neighbors. Is Nature is your neighbor and it is your family. And not in a gooey, fluffy way. Your life literally depends on the nature that's all around you, even in a city. So talk to it, talk to the waterways in the city, talk to the drains, talk to the water running through the drains, talk to the weather that goes overhead. By doing that, and if you keep a journal, you will start to feel the shifts in your personality and in the way you approach things on a day-to-day -day basis. It becomes a fascinating adventure of discovery. I hope that little snippet was useful in some way. Um, um, it, it's difficult for me without questions going backwards and forwards as, as to what information people actually find useful and, and um, can go away with. Um, but I, I really do think for magic that bringing nature into magic and putting magic back out in nature on a day to day, not on a four times a year, we go up to a stone circle type of magic, but I go out every day, I pick up litter, I talk to the birds, I talk to the plants, I notice what's dying off and what's growing. And I just observe. Um, if people have that sort of an attitude, it changes who you are as a person, it also changes your relationships with the other humans around you. And, and the more that that can grow out in, in the communities, I think overall in popular culture and the environment and the ecological disasters that we're facing can cause a shift. There's all the big important stuff that we all know about and know to do, but we forget about the little everyday stuff that really does change society over a long period of time. So magicians, get talking to your weeds. And um, I hope that was useful. Thank you. <laughs>